This is a shaper. It's kind of like a mill, but maybe you'd rather think of them as a linear lathe? In any case, they're good at making flat surfaces and cutting slots. They're more or less obsolete, being rather slow and nowhere near as versatile as a vertical mill. Except for cutting internal keyways, that's the one thing they're still quite good at. But they're also just really cool, and I had been keeping an eye open for one for quite some time. Having a wish list of things to search for on Craigslist once or twice a week is really a great way to stay awake during meetings. So the fun thing about the shaper market is that the smaller benchtop models are all collector's items, and go for a lot more than the larger floor models. Luckily, a larger floor model is exactly what I was hoping to find. And last November, I finally did. A 16-inch Milwaukee shaper, in very good condition, lacking only the vice. After driving up to Bellingham to check it out, I rented a flatbed to retrieve it, and had a forklift dropped off at the shop, ready to unload. Once again, I am amazed at what you can get delivered, sight unseen with only a credit card. The whole unloading process, even getting it into the inner shop, went so smoothly I didn't bother to get any footage, just the stills I always get for personal documentation purposes. Sorry. And this is it. I can't tell you quite how old it is. Mine is serial number 337, but I haven't been able to find a dated list to compare against. The door casting mentions their 1906 patent, and in 1916 the Luder and Gies company spun off their shaper line to form the Milwaukee Shaper Company. The table feed mechanism on mine is different from the 1906 patent drawing, though, matching the one in their follow-up patent filed at the beginning of 1910. The old mechanism was still being shown in this ad from April of that year, but had been updated by the time this write-up ran later that summer. So somewhere between mid-1910 and 1916 is the best I've been able to figure out. I haven't been able to find an original price for any version of it either, though I did find these classy ads. About the only notable thing I found, according to a 1920 hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, is that the Milwaukee Shaper Company sold $45,000 of machinery to the Soviet Bureau. It was originally meant to be run from a line shaft system. Sadly, I don't have the ceiling height to install one of those, though I can dream. Maybe water wheel powered if I'm really lucky? But someone retrofitted this lovely motor assembly onto it at some point in the last hundred years. It includes an actual transmission, what I believe is a Dodge A745 from the 1960s. Once running, you lever the motor back to tighten the belt drive with these levers. Just lovely. The operation is pretty simple. This part, the ram, moves back and forth. You attach a tool here using what is basically an old-school lathe tool holder. This is called the clapper for obvious reasons. It pivots to allow the tool to lift up on the backstroke. That's particularly important, because the backstroke is when you advance the cut, either side to side or down into the part. If the tool couldn't pivot out of the way, it would be driven into the workpiece, backwards. The part being machined either clamps down directly to this table or sits in a vise. This one didn't come with a vise, which is too bad, because those are expensive and rare to find on their own. Presumably they were all borrowed off shapers, never to be returned, during the many decades they sat in the corner of shops unloved and forgotten. They're basically like mill vices, but built much beefier and usually with extra mounting points for bolting them down. Shapers exert a lot of force as they cut. This handle lets you disconnect the ram from the driving mechanism. Once freed, the business end can be moved back and forth, so its stroke will be centered on the part, whether it is close in or far out on the table. Like a DC bias, basically. Let's look inside. The length of the stroke is determined by how far out the sliding block is on the crank gear. By moving it with this wheel, the reading on the stroke length dial changes. Inside, the sliding block is moving farther out on the crank gear. Now when the machine runs, the rocker arm moves much further with every rotation, and thus, so does the ram. This model will go from nothing all the way up to a bit over 16 inches. Big, but not catastrophically big. This lovely mechanism is the automatic feed for the table. As part of the ram stroke cycle, this head pivots back and forth. The connecting rod is attached on top, and by moving it back and forth in the dovetail, you can change both how far it moves on each cycle, but also its phase relative to the ram. Through linkages over here, that linear oscillation is turned back to rotary. By dropping this pawl down, we can advance the table. 
turn the pawl around 180 degrees, and it only catches on the other half of the cycle. This lets you advance the table either to the right or to the left. And this is where the phase selection back on the pivoting head becomes important. You only want to advance the table during the retract phase of the ram motion. So if you're cutting to the right, it needs to be in this configuration, while if you're cutting to the left, it needs to be like this instead. And that's pretty much it. This one has some centralized lubrication added on, but there are still plenty of grease and oil points to keep track of. So how do you use it? Good question. I'd read about them and watched video. I even got to see one being used at the Deutsche Technik Museum in Berlin once, but I'd never touched one. I don't think I even knew anyone who had touched one. So it was time for some trial and error. First step was grinding a tool. This is a high-speed steel blank, abbreviated to HSS in text, but not usually when spoken. It's an alloy that can retain its hardness, even after getting quite hot, unlike normal high-carbon tool steel, which will start to lose its temper at just a few hundred degrees. You can use this steel for cutting at much higher speeds, hence high-speed steel. The focus has moved on to carbide inserts these days, but high-speed steel was a very big deal when it first came out in the 19th century. Before that, you had to quench and temper every cutting tool, hoping it didn't distort too much in the process, and then monitor its usage to make sure it didn't get too hot. These are the seemingly minor changes from which massive gains in productivity are made over the decades. I think tooling is the key to understanding the shaper. Particularly, why were they ever popular and why did they go away? It's all about tooling. You can easily make your own lathe tooling with some high-speed steel and a grinder. Same with a shaper. But mill tooling is much more complicated. Even simple horizontal mill cutters have some much more complicated geometry. And end mills need precise helices cut, which is significantly harder still. So earlier in the Industrial Revolution, when material things were comparatively far more expensive, a shaper made sense. But as mass-produced tooling became cheaper and cheaper, suddenly the labor costs of running such a slow machine became more and more significant. By the middle of the 20th century, they were already becoming museum pieces. A couple are still being made, but the one time I went to IMTS, one of the larger machining expos in the world, the kind where they bring in three-story machining centers just to run demos on for the week, I saw a total of one shaper, and that was at a heritage display at the South Bend booth. It was surrounded by a small crowd of graybeards reminiscing, and, uh, me. With my first tool ready, I clamped on some steel and started cutting. First chips immediately followed by my first clamping failure. So, yeah, the forces are really, really high. I added more clamps and got some real cuts done before the part moved again. I was definitely wishing I had waited to find one with a vice at this point. But, since the nearest shaper vice listed on eBay is in Reno, pickup only, I just had to figure out a way to hold the workpiece steady for now. I made this kind of backstop, which clamped directly to the T-nuts, to brace the part from behind. That seemed to work. I still want to get a real vice for it, of course, but at least I can get some practice on the thing in the meantime. After a bunch of iterations of tool shape and orientation, I started to get some halfway decent results with a roughing cutter. These experiments drove home a real problem with my clapper. It wouldn't clap. Despite liberal application of penetrating oil, the motion on the pivot was just too stiff to let it fall back down into place. I could push it back manually after each pass, but that got old really quickly. Remember how I said shapers are pretty slow? That means a lot of standing around for even a short little cut. I tried knocking the pivot pin out in situ with no success, so I assumed it was riveted in place. After removing the tool head entirely, which gave me a nice chance to properly clean the lead screw, I tried pounding on it a bit more. Good thing I did, because it turns out it was a taper pin. That would have been really annoying to remake after needlessly destroying it. After getting the gunk cleaned out, the clapper was clapping properly once again. I also made a replacement for this locking screw on the clapper swivel. This lets you change the angle the clapper swings back on, which is important when cutting up against a shoulder. Note that this is separate from the downfeed angle adjustment. That changes the angle the tool moves down on for cutting dovetails or other angled features. The clapper swivel is independent of that, so you can be cutting down at one angle while the tool swings up at a completely different one. The socket cap it came with worked fine, but it's a modern replacement and doesn't match the long 19th century vibes of the rest of the machine. 
Plus, I wanted something I could adjust using the same wrench as the tool holder, to reduce the number of tools needed on hand for common operation. I think this just looks so much better this way. Looking at the ads closer, I think this was originally a square head though, not hex. I might re-re-remake it later. We'll see. Having started to feel comfortable on the machine, it was time to use it to make something real. Its own tea nuts. If you haven't come across these, they're for attaching things to the tables of machine tools, which often have a set of T-slots cast and milled into them. You can get by by using screws with wide square heads, but these have the disadvantage of not being able to be placed on the far side of anything already mounted. The entire slot needs to be free in order to slide them into place. With a T-nut, you can slide it into place even if something is already spanning the slot in places, then screw the stud down into it on the far side. I had picked up a basic cheap milling clamp set for it, and they worked okay except for one problem. The shaper's T-slot proportions are rather odd, at least by modern standards. The slots are only one half inch wide, meaning it needed clamps with 3 8 inch studs. Fairly weedy for something with so much oomph in my opinion but the lower part of the slot was both much wider and much taller than modern half-inch T-nuts are expecting. The ones that came with the clamping kit rattle around in them like a shoe in a clothes dryer. This isn't just aesthetically unpleasant, it means they tend to jam sideways and are needlessly hard to move into position, so some custom ones seem to be called for. First, a quarter inch had to be taken off the top of this entire bar, to make it one inch by one and an eighth inch. This was very, very slow, but couldn't be left alone because the clamps had to keep being moved out of the way. At least with the clapper mechanism working again, I didn't have to manually intervene on each and every pass. With the stock in the correct dimensions, it had to have rabbits cut on either side to form the T. This meant the piece was clamped down lengthwise, with the shaper taking long cuts along its entire length, 12 inches at a time. This went a lot faster. The total time of each stroke is always the same for the same motor speed, so it can cut a lot more material more quickly if the piece is aligned along the ram axis. Obvious, now that I think about it, but this is why you need to get hands-on experience with a tool to really understand it. Or why I do, anyway. The T-slot castings on the table are rough enough that the piece kept jamming when I tested the fit, so I had to make several extra passes removing 50 thou at a time before it fit properly. With that done, the shaper had done everything it could do. Normally, when needing to drill a bunch of evenly spaced holes, I'd throw it on the mill and use the DRO. But in keeping with the overall theme, I did the layout for these holes old school, and drilled them on the drill press. These were then tapped, itself a rather slow process for 9 3 8 16 holes, each an inch deep, then cut apart on the bandsaw and cleaned up a bit with a file. I'll leave these a bit rough for now, instead of making them perfect on the mill. If I ever find a shaper vise, maybe I'll clean them up properly then. One last, very important step. Smashing the threads on the lower side so the studs can't screw all the way through. Why destroy what I just finished making, you ask? Because you want a toe clamp to work by increasing the tension in the stud, pulling the clamp down onto the piece. The more you turn, the tighter the workpiece is clamped. But if the threads through the T-nut are complete, then the stud can thread all the way through it, and it can keep going. Once it hits the bottom of the slot, it'll push the T-nut up, harder and harder with every turn. But since this isn't increasing tension in the stud, your clamp still isn't tight enough. You keep turning. This levers up the top of the T-slot, in the worst place possible, right next to this stress riser in the corner. If you don't notice what is going on and just keep turning... It's far too easy to break off a chunk of the slot this way, something not uncommonly seen on old, abused machines. So, always make sure your T-nuts have a damaged thread before they damage something much more expensive. Then just a quick cold blue application to match the rest of the clamp set, and they were done. And look at that fit, so much better. They're not perfect, but they're perfectly fit for purpose. Most importantly, it was a great introduction to the exciting new world of machining on the shaper. The only real issue with them is they don't fit into the slots on the clamping set. So that's it, my new 100 plus year old shaper. Next up I'd like to do a complete teardown on it and a deep clean, but that probably isn't video material. How often do I think I'll use it? 
I don't know, but I am definitely looking forward to the next time I have to cut an internal keyway.